Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School, the Lubar Center. I'm Mike Goucher, and today we're releasing our new uh, results from a national survey of uh, political attitudes and issues uh, in America. Uh, Charles Franklin, the poll director for Marquette University Law School, is with us today. Charles, always good to be with you. Um, this poll is part of a, a national sur survey we've been doing uh, to look at Supreme Court attitudes. So, but we asked some other questions along the way. Yes, we, we are now doing um, a national poll focused mostly on the Supreme Court every two months throughout the year. Um, but if you're going to be in the survey in the field asking questions, you might as well include a few about pertinent national issues as well. And it gives us a chance to look at some issues that are of national significance that reflect how the country is evolving in these years and both throughout this year and over the rest of the uh, next presidential term and into the next, we hope to continue these to provide this national look at a variety of issues as they, as they come at us, as they say. So uh, I think if you watched the poll release yesterday, the Supreme Court poll release, you know that we were in the field from November 1st to November 10th. Uh, how many people again did we talk to, Charles? Uh, we interviewed 1,004 people. It's a margin of error of plus or minus 3.9%. And in these national surveys, we interview people who are 18 and over, whether they're registered to vote or not. Um, that's a departure from the Wisconsin surveys of registered voters. But we're interested in public opinion here, and so the whole public gets a chance to have an opinion on these things. And we interview people through a uh, method of, a modern method of survey sampling in which um, postal delivery addresses are selected at random around the country so that everybody has a known and equal chance of being selected into the sample. Um, they're then invited to participate in a series of surveys, one of which is ours, and um, are sent a, if they agree to participate, are sent an invitation which is only good for them specifically, can only be used once. No one can volunteer to be in the survey. Nobody can sit and answer the survey a hundred times. So this is very much like a telephone survey with a random sample, where you can't volunteer to do a telephone survey. We have to call your number, which we selected at random. Um, and so this is somewhat different than some of the older style web surveys that rely on volunteers rather than a random sample um, and, and really represents the state of the art. Our surveys are conducted by our partner uh, SSRS, a large survey firm located in Pennsylvania, which invites the people to participate, draws the sample for us. Well, we're gonna to begin today with uh, a few questions about uh, former President Donald Trump. And uh, here we are, Charles, uh, Joe Biden has not completed his first year in office, but some people are already talking about 2024. We can believe that, just around the corner. <laughs> and, uh, and so you hear Donald Trump's name being mentioned as a possible candidate again in 2024. We asked people if they thought he should run again. Yeah. What and, did they say? And, and well, first of all, 28% uh, uh, say they would like for Trump to run again. 71% would not like him to run again. Um, you know, we're asking this question uh, in part out of just curiosity, but because this issue, uh, the possibility of him running has gotten so much attention. And recently we've seen other Republicans talking more about running regardless of whether Trump does. I think we're trying here to capture what's going on within the Republican Party, how our opinion shifting vis-a-vis -vis President Trump and potential other candidates. We won't know the answer to this for another two and a half years, but we need to start setting a baseline for where Trump stands with the electorate and where he stands with the Republican Party because after all, primary voters are really critical. So you just mentioned overall uh, amongst all respondents, 28% want him to run again, 71% don't, but very different story within the Republican Party. And here it's a solid majority. 60% of people who call themselves Republicans want him to run. 
Though a not trivial, 40% say they'd rather he not. Now, if you dig down just a little bit, those folks who consider themselves strong Republicans are even more pro-Trump and a little less unwilling to see him run. So there's another little division within the party. There is a sizable minority that's not looking for him to run, but among those most intense partisans, Trump does even a little better among Republicans. How about his favorability ratings, Charles? How, how does he fare with the, the public? Uh, with the public at, at large, um, 32% are favorable, 65% unfavorable. Just 3% say they don't have an opinion of him. You know, it's been the case with President Trump since he first entered the race in 2015 that he's had almost always net negative favorability ratings, but nevertheless won the presidency in 2016. Uh, so you don't want to make too much of it, but in the same way as should he run or not, and what are the divisions within the party over him? Uh, this is uh, a reason to, to track it. Also, we can compare favorability across multiple candidates, whereas job approval only applies to the current president. You can't ask right. job approval of a former president, really. Um, and you know the same thing that we saw with uh, whether he should run and party shows up here. 73% of Republicans have a favorable view of him, which is 13 points higher than the percentage that would like him to run again. There again is sort of an interesting That's thing. Interesting. Within the party, three quarters have a favorable view, but only 60% would like him to run again. So again, you see a little bit of slippage here, uh, though still very solid support. Uh, Independents, much more negative, 68% unfavorable, 28% favorable. And Democrats really don't like former President Trump very much, 92% unfavorable. In our last uh, State of Wisconsin survey, uh, we asked about a potential rematch uh, between uh, the current president, Joe Biden, and the former president, Donald Trump. Uh, we asked that question here on a national uh, level. Uh, what did people tell us? And here we get 34% for Trump, 42% uh, for Biden. 18% though say they would not vote for either of these two candidates and another 6% say they wouldn't vote at all. Remember, these, this is a sample of adults, not registered voters. We might look at registered voters some other time, but right now, again, we're looking at the size of these coalitions and where their divisions. And I, in some ways, think the takeaway here is that 18% that say they'd vote for neither and another 6% wouldn't vote. So we're up to about a quarter of the electorate that are uh, not really enthralled with a rematch between these two candidates. Uh, Joe Biden's favorability, the president's favorability. Yeah, he's at 45% favorable, 49% unfavorable, and 6% say they don't have an opinion of him. So a little bit underwater as his job approval number is a little bit underwater. Has he made any inroads with uh, independents, with Republicans, or, or is he struggling? There? Yeah, not so much as of the November survey um, with Republicans, 13% have a favorable opinion of Biden, so not very many. But among independents, a majority, 55% are unfavorable, 38% favorable. This reflects some of his sinking job approval numbers with independents, and it carries over to their likability, if you will, or his likability uh, with independents. Democrats are still very positive, 83% favorable, 13 unfavorable. So there's been, uh, over the weekend, last few days, uh, a fair amount of uh, talk in national media circles about uh, the vice president, Kamala Harris, and how things are going for her and how everything's working within the administration. We asked uh, about her favorability numbers. Yeah, and her numbers are 38% favorable, 46% unfavorable, but she has 16% who say they don't have an opinion about her. Uh, 10 points higher than for Biden. Um, but it does mean her net favorability is a fair bit below his. And by party ID, Charles, any difference in how people view her? Yeah, uh, Democrats are still quite positive, but not quite as much okay. as for Biden. 76 favorable, 13 unfavorable. So you certainly wouldn't look at that and say that's a turning away from Harris among Democrats. 
And again, it's not surprising that any vice president is in a weaker position sure. uh, than their president is. 10% of Republicans are favorable to her, but again, independents are pretty solidly not 47% unfavorable, 29% favorable, and a pretty large 24% without an opinion. So she and Biden are, are fairly, in the minds of, of the people we talk to, they're, they're fairly closely linked. I, I think that maybe is uh, the most striking thing coming out of some of the talk about Harris and a potential fight for a nomination in 2024. Um, you might think that there are real divisions here, but I really don't think we see that. Um, <clears throat> it's true that 36% of all respondents have a favorable view of both Biden and Harris. 41% are unfavorable to both, and that largely reflects mm -hmm. partisan divides. But then it's pretty symmetrical. 4% are favorable to Biden, but unfavorable to Harris. Uh, but 2% are unfavorable to Biden and favorable to Harris. So if you're looking for, uh, you know, sort of a divisiveness within opinions here, you're really looking at only a two-point gap on two numbers that are already quite small. Um, that doesn't mean that Harris's fate is inextricably linked to Biden's. But at this point, people's impressions of the two of them are closely linked with the proviso that there is less knowledge about Harris than there is about Biden. Do, do Republicans view them any differently? Well, much more negatively. I mean, uh, but, but do they view know, Biden differently um, than Harris? Yeah, and no, uh, you would, won't be at all surprised to know that 80% uh, of, of Republicans are unfavorable to both. But again, there's very little division. There are a few Republicans favorable to both. And the split decisions favorable Biden, unfavorable Harris is only a little bit bigger than the other way around, unfavorable Biden, favorable Harris. So again, I think that there's certainly room for seeing these as two separate political actors with separate long-term fates. But from the point of view of public opinion, whether we're looking at this within the Democratic Party or within the Republican Party, or independents for that matter. Really, you either like them both or dislike them both, and it's just a small percentage that like one and not the other. What about Mike Pence, Charles, uh, the former vice president? Um, you know, since we were asking about um, Kamala Harris, um, um, sorry. Uh, we also wanted to ask about Mike Pence, who's also been said to be interested in running uh, for the presidency in mm -hmm. three years now. 29% uh, uh, um, view him favorably, 51% unfavorably, 20% say they don't know enough to have an opinion about him. Uh, that unfavorable rating is not nearly as high as pre former President Trump's was uh, earlier. And, uh, but as with Harris, 20% that don't have an opinion is, is pretty high, especially for someone that spent four years in the White House as vice president. How did uh, Pence fare with uh, the various political uh, groups? Yeah, pretty well among Republicans. 64% were favorable, 22 unfavorable, 14 no opinion. Again, you've certainly heard a lot of chatter on Pence, the different chatter from Harris, but similar in one sense, that many Republicans were upset because Pence presided over the Electoral College count, and didn't try to derail that. But in our data, it doesn't look like that's particularly hurting him among Republicans. Um, he also does pretty well with uh, people who are favorable to Donald Trump, though not as well as Harris does with people who are favorable to Biden. So maybe there's a little slippage there. And finally, uh, Pence is seen a bit more favorably by Republicans who are skeptical about the election outcome than he is among Republicans who are not skeptical about the outcome. So I think with the questions we have, we're not seeing much evidence that there's a broad scale 
blowback against Mike Pence. Now, we did not specifically ask about how he handled mm -hmm. January 6th and whether he should have been more supportive of keeping Trump in office. Uh, so I'll leave the door open to probing those questions a bit more. Um, but just on the face of the favorability and how they match up with his, uh, President Trump, mm -hmm. uh, his president, Trump, when he was in office, uh, I don't think we're seeing much evidence that Pence is really being vilified on this, at least in the eyes of the general public. So uh, let's talk for a moment, Charles, about the, uh, the, um, the public's uh, opinions about the accuracy of the 2020 election, whether the votes were accurately cast and counted. And here, 65% say they're very or somewhat confident that it was accurate. 35% uh, say they're not very or not at all confident in the election. Uh, those are in line with other times we've asked this question. We see close to a two to one majority who say they're confident in the election outcome. Uh, there are, of course, big partisan gaps yeah. here. And, and, there, <laughs> and the numbers for Republicans, there is a lot yeah. of doubt. Yes, there is. Yeah. And I think this is telling as we pay attention to this issue and how it plays out uh, going into the 2022 midterm elections, how much of an issue is it there, as well as for the future. But within Republican identifiers, 68% say they're not confident in the election outcome. Just 31% say they are. So that's the reverse of what the overall public opinion is. And it's also basically the reverse of opinion among independent voters, where 62% are confident, 38% have doubts. Um, among Democrats, it's no surprise that it's nearly unanimous. 95% say they're confident. So one obvious thing here is if your party lost, you're not confident. If your party won, you are confident. But among those independents who aren't as committed to a party, it's still that roughly two to one uh, advantage for confident in the election. Um, I'd also say that 31% among Republicans who are pretty confident in the election outcome, or at least not doubting it, are an interesting problem for Republicans who want to pursue in election investigations or audits, and this is maybe more of an issue at the state level these days. But it does mean that there is a solid majority within the Republican Party that wants to pursue these allegations a minority in the party that would like to move on to other things, and a host of candidates planning to run in 2022 or afterwards trying to figure out how to navigate this split within the party and whether this is a winning issue for primaries in the coming months and whether it's a winning issue for general elections when the balance of opinion in the party runs opposite to the balance of opinion in the public at large. Charles, we talked about Joe Biden's uh, favorability numbers uh, earlier um, underwater. Let's talk about his job approval numbers, which I would assume are fairly similar. Yeah, and, and they are 49% uh, approved, 51 disapprove. We had it at 48.52 uh, in September. But those numbers were down in September by 10 points from 58% approve, 42 disapprove in July. So in our data, we saw a big drop in mm -hmm. July to September, middle of September, but we haven't seen a continuing change. Uh, some polling so, is yeah. a good deal below where we are. Part of that is that telephone polls tend to give a lower approval rating than online polls, regardless of the company that and the methodology that, that does the online polling. So we are typically three or so points higher than the polling average, which uh, last time I checked uh, yesterday was running about 42 or a little below 42. So we are a bit high compared to that. But the trend that we're seeing and the fact that he's underwater, even if only by a little bit, uh, I think is certainly consistent with what everybody found from 
about early mid-July to the early fall that uh, Biden had taken a substantial drop in job approval. So uh, from those halcyon days earlier in the summer for Biden to where he is today, where where has he lost support? Has it been amongst all uh, political groups? Or? No, and I think this is where our data, even though the average overall hadn't moved very much, is especially striking. <coughs> Among independents, he's fallen 14 percentage points since July from 57 to 43% approval, uh, with 57 now disapproving. So those numbers have really reversed from the summer. And again, with this critical independent group that moves more than usually we see other parties do. But Democrats have dropped uh, 13 points from an astronomical 96 in July to a <coughs> fairly normal 83% within your party now. <coughs> so I think with these two groups, you really see the key to how he fell. Now, we did have some somewhat confusing results among Republicans. They don't seem to have moved much from July to November. 16% uh, approval in July, 17 now. But in September, we did have them lower at nine points. So they seem to have bounced back up. <coughs> or maybe we just had a bit of an unusual sample there. But I think the steady movement in independents and Democrats is really worth paying attention to. Well, as we've seen in, in some of our statewide polling, uh, you see issues like inflation emerge. And that tends to be one of those issues that cuts across party lines. Doesn't matter if you're a Democrat yes. or a Republican yes. or an independent, if you're paying more for the things you buy, uh, that might affect your attitude a bit. Absolutely, them. and in our Wisconsin polling last week, we saw a substantial rise in concern with inflation. We also saw the right direction, wrong track numbers well underwater. Now, we didn't ask right direction, wrong track on this national survey, but there are a host of other surveys that have been asking about this, and yeah, the public generally seems really quite negative on the state of affairs right at the moment. I think the word was grumpy that you used to uh, describe the public uh, a, a week or two ago. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think you could see that reflected in, in the way people think about Congress. Now, we should point out we were in the field at a time where they hadn't quite completed action on the infrastructure bill. So, Maybe people feel a little differently about Congress, maybe not. Yeah, it's, it's hard for us to tell. Um, Congress finally passed the bipartisan infrastructure mm -hmm. bill when we had finished 72%, 78% of our interviews. So we really don't have enough after they acted to see anything. Mm -hmm. It didn't stop me from looking, but I don't see much difference in our pre-passage, post-passage but the cases are so few that I don't mm -hmm. think we would be confident in saying it if, if we did see a big change. Um, Biden's signing the bill and perhaps promoting the bill. Well, we'll see what happens in the coming months. But um, I think it's best to think of our poll as essentially completed before that. You know, Congress never fares terribly well in job approval numbers. Uh, even if we like our member of Congress, we don't like the body very much, the institution. In July, 33% approved, 66% disapproved. And now it's 27 approved, 72 disapproved. So there has been about a six point change in both of those numbers making Congress look worse, not better. Do, do Democrats feel any more warmly towards Congress since, at least for the moment, they uh, control both the House and the Senate? And, and they do, but not quite positive. No. Uh, Democrats in July were at 43 approved, 55 disapproved. They're at 45, 54 now. So basically yeah. no change among Democrats, uh, but higher than the other groups. But independents have fallen off a bit from 31 to 23 in approval and, and Republicans from 22 to 15. So the movement on the Congress side is coming from Republicans and independents with Democrats stable, whereas Biden's approval had moved among independents and Democrats with Republicans stable. Yeah, interesting. Um, Charles, let's uh, talk about... Uh, um the vaccinations, and, and we've been asking a, a lot of questions over the last uh, year and a half about the about COVID and about the vaccines. And and one of the things we asked about in this poll is the um, the policy decision that says 
Corporations with more than 100 employees must have their employees vaccinated or undergo regular testing. How do Americans feel about that? 56% uh, support those required vaccinations or testing. 44% uh, are opposed. Uh, and uh, whatever that leaves, almost nothing. Yeah. Uh, didn't offer us an opinion on that. Uh, there's a sharp party split on this. You won't probably be surprised. Among Republicans, 28 favor the mandate or the requirement. 72% are opposed. Democrats more than the opposite, 80% in favor, 20% opposed. But among those independents, again, the sort of swing voters, if you will, 55% favor the mandate, 45% opposed, pretty much in line with the overall public opinion. That's a, a stronger number than we saw in our, <coughs> our statewide poll, where it was more split in terms of you know, support for the, the requirement, the vaccine requirement. We've seen some variation in that in across polls on mask requirements for schools, which have generally been that positive, but vaccine requirements, some are more evenly split like we saw in Wisconsin last week. Charles, let's talk about whether people still see the coronavirus as a serious problem. We, we see numbers. It, it depends, I guess, where you live in this country right now, what you're experiencing. Uh, cases in parts of the South have gone down. Cases in Wisconsin, Minnesota, some of the northern states, some of the western states have gone up. Do people still think COVID is serious? Uh, yes. Uh, we asked the question in terms of, is coronavirus a serious problem in your state now, mm -hmm. at this time? Mm -hmm. um, and we did that in part in September because we were catching the upward wave of cases in November uh, almost all of the states are down from where they were in that September surge, though, as with Wisconsin, some of us are working our way back up again a second time. So there are some variations there. But overall, I think the numbers are very consistent with declining incidence of cases. In September, 68% said it was a serious problem in their state. 32% not. And this month, it's an even 50-50 split. So there's been a substantial decline in that number. And it's uh, across the partisan divide. Republicans, independents, and Democrats all see less of a problem now than they did in September, though Democrats see it as more of a problem than Republicans do, regardless of which month we're looking at. What about uh, regions of the country? I, I just mentioned that the, the South has seen cases go down, uh, in some cases fairly precipitously. Uh, what are we seeing uh, in terms of uh, regions and whether that affects people's attitudes about this being still a big deal? And, and the South is a great example because they were very hard hit in September in the surge of cases. Um, at that point in the South, 78% said it was very it said it was a serious problem. That's fallen all the way to 53% now. And the West has fallen as well, substantially, 67 down to 48. Uh, the West is kind of a mixed picture between the Mountain West and the Pacific coast area. Uh, Midwest has come down some, but only some from 59 to 50. And again, some of the Midwestern states are currently seeing a bit of a resurgence. And in the East, uh, also not as much of a decline from 59 to 46% saying it's a, a serious problem there. And I think you touched on this, but, but party ID, this kind of cuts through party ID, how people view this, this pandemic. Yes, um, um, at least the movement of it. So yeah. Republicans have seen it as less of a problem than Democrats, no matter what month we've asked it in. But Republicans went from 49 serious to 30 serious from September to now. But Democrats went from 90% serious to 70% serious this month. So they, they disagree on how serious it is, but they agree along with independents that it's not as bad now as it was in September. Interesting. How many people are vaccinated based on our, our poll? Yeah, and this is a good benchmark for us. We have 78% of this sample who say they've had at least one dose of the vaccine. Um, 
According to the Centers for Disease Control, as of last Friday, the day that we finished the survey, or the day after we finished the survey, uh, they reported that 81% of those 18 and over had had at least one dose. So we're three points below that, but that's pretty close, and it's a good benchmark to see that our survey respondents on, on this thing that we have a pretty good measure for from CDC really are matching up pretty closely with the government data. And based on other surveys, Charles, I, I would assume that uh, there are fairly significant partisan differences in vaccination rates. Yes. 70% um, of Republicans say that they've been vaccinated, 74% mm -hmm. uh, of independents, and 89% of Democrats say that they have. So there is a pretty sharp uh, variation there. But when we look at whether you think it's a serious problem within party, uh, Republicans who say it's serious, 90% are vaccinated. Democrats who say it's serious, 93% are vaccinated. So I think a kind of takeaway there is that if you think this is a serious problem, it has tended to override any partisan feelings you have. But thinking it's not a serious problem maybe goes along with partisanship and it certainly exa exacerbates partisan effects. And so we get a bigger gap between those partisans who don't think it's serious. We've got about 20% uh, out there uh, of adults who are not vaccinated according to both our right. survey and according to the CDC numbers. Uh, how much reluctance is there among that group? Are, are they going to get vaccinated or are they probably not? Well, it remains a, a difficult group to persuade. 47% of the unvaccinated say they definitely will not get vaccinated. Another 34% say they probably won't. Now, that number has been shrinking mm -hmm. over the months, right? As more and more people have gotten vaccinated, as we've reached that 81% that CDC is reporting. So it makes sense that the reluctant group would still be a very substantial share of the unvaccinated. Um, but it has been running at half or considerably more than half if you include those who probably won't. There are some people out there, 18%, who say they'll definitely or probably will still get vaccinated. And so it's not a vanishingly small number. But the majority of the unvaccinated are at the very least reluctant and at most resistant, uh, at least verbally on a right, survey. Right. Let's uh, wrap things up, Charles, by returning to uh, where we began. And, and this is about the impact of, of Donald Trump, who remains <coughs> obviously from these numbers and reporting uh, uh, very much a, a major force within the Republican Party. Um, but also with, uh, for elections that require perhaps more than the strong Trump support to win, there are still issues for Republican candidates with Donald Trump being closely associated with them. I think this is the, really the takeaway, whether you're looking at wanting him to run again or his favorability or how he matches up with Joe Biden, is that the Republican Party is still very positive to Donald Trump. But with the caveat that there is a minority of the party that likes him, but is less enthusiastic about him running again. 40%. 40% who would like him not to run again. Um, you know, the Virginia governor's race we saw is maybe an example of a Republican candidate who largely embraced Trump's issues and supporters, but kept him at arm's length in terms of Endorsing, endorsements campaigning with and those sorts of things. I think um, the issue for Republicans is how to, how to balance his strong appeal among Republican, especially primary voters, with his lack of appeal when we look at the general electorate or the population as a whole. Um, and, and that will be a challenge really in two ways. One is what, are, what role does President Trump play in setting the agenda for the Republican Party 
setting the issues that the party talks about going through the 2022 midterms next year. And as we get past that, uh, there are still a number of Republicans who would like to be president in, after 2024. And how do they handle the, the negotiations with a base of the party that likes Donald Trump? Can they persuade them that, yes, we all love Donald Trump, but it's time to have a new candidate? Or do they fail to do that and, and President Trump reemerges as, again, a powerhouse in the party that intimidates other candidates to stay out of races. I think it's fascinating to watch and see how it plays out, and that's why we're laying the groundwork for it yeah, I, I would in these say, surveys. I would say, Charles, the, the challenge for, for Republicans is you gotta win the primary. So uh, having the, the, the support of Donald Trump or his followers, his really strong followers, uh, is almost essential to win a, a primary. But if you're in a competitive state, if you're in a Wisconsin and you're trying to bring back those suburbs to the Republican fold, um, it's a real challenge. It's an interesting challenge. It certainly is. And if we can just add one further complication, a unpopular Democratic president also throws another element into all of this by providing just sort of national headwinds for Democrats and a tailwind for Republicans, at least as of now. It's still a long ways to election day. Um, but that can boost Republican candidates independent of Trump, but due to the sort of normal letdown that the president's party experiences in midterms. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, year. Uh, and then we can talk about 2024. <laughs> Stay tuned. It'll come <laughs> Stay in good tuned, time. Exactly. Charles, always <laughs> great to visit with you. Charles Franklin, the director of the Marquette University Law School poll. Thanks for being with us today. We'll see you next time.